Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Drone Life News. My name is Paul. Joining me as always is Editor-in-Chief of DroneLife.com, Miss Miriam McNabb. Miriam, how are you doing today? I am doing excellent. It is a beautiful day. Spring has sprung. How are you? Oh, I love those crisp mornings that have moisture and you smell that petrichor and oh, I love it. It's like fuel. I don't know how to explain it, but uh, I'm loving spring just like you. And that might be a great segue actually into our first story. As many public safety departments, Miriam, as you know, have been theoretically limited in what drones they can buy. But a new survey out showcases that if these public safety agencies were to adhere to those rules, uh, it could essentially well negate a lot of public safety drone programs. I know I did a terrible synopsis of this story, but what's going on here? So as um, I think many people know, Florida kind of uh, hit the drone industry with a little bit of a stunner a few months ago when they published the Florida approved drone manufacturers list. Now, that list um, by Florida State was kind of confusing to a lot of the drone industry because it referred back to sort of the very original blue SUAS list. If we recall that blue SUAS list listed five drone models, but the Florida approved drone manufacturers list just took the people who made those models and put them on the list. So it was, it was kind of confusing um, all the way around. I think that given feedback, that list is evolving to mirror the Defense Innovation Unit's um, blue SUAS list. However, AIRT and drone responders who are located down in Florida do have a good relationship with many of the state agencies using drones, did a survey. They surveyed 60 agencies and they said, hey, what are you using currently um, in your fleet. What is this drone manufacturer's list going to mean for your agency? And, you know, what would you think about maybe them introducing a waiver system to solve this problem? And the answers were surprising, not surprising, right? So we all know that DJI is still remains absolutely the dominant drone manufacturer in the United States. Of course, it is still absolutely the dominant drone manufacturer for state agencies also. State agencies have problems getting funding, getting training, getting, you know, the money and the approval to purchase uh, fleets. So if they have an existing fleet of DJI drones and you say this is over by the end of the year, that really hampers drone programs. It means they have a very short amount of time to basically start from scratch with all new hardware and new training. So essentially more than 95% of these state agencies said this is going to negatively impact our drone program and more than 85% said this is very seriously going to impact our drone program. So I think um, moral of the story is, you know, this adoption of a defense oriented list for state agencies is really needs to be better thought out because this can have very uh, serious consequences for drone programs in the state, which are really benefiting Florida taxpayers here. You know, I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to speak to the DIU directly. You know, they're very aware of these issues. They have been in communication with Florida State. You know, the DIU is kind of in the unfortunate position of being the only people out there right now who have picked up the baton and said, yeah, we'll, we'll vet. Um, drones for security, but they are designed for the Department of Defense. That's who pays them. You know, that's that's what their directive is. Their job is to vet these drones for the Department of Defense. They certainly don't take the position that that's an appropriate uh, list for everybody to use. I think what they feel is that everybody should use maybe their process and develop their own list of manufacturers that's appropriate for their needs. Um, but at any rate, we hope that 
maybe Florida State uh, will reconsider or at least give people more time or put in a waiver um, program. And I hope that a lot of other states don't pick up the baton and say, hey, well, this is easy for us. This is the easiest way to make sure that our drones have have secure platforms. Because, you know, the tool that's designed for the Department of Defense is not necessarily the best tool for uh, a state agency. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Do you feel like that this research coming out is going to change anything? Do you think it's going to have an effect to negate any of the policies that have been put in place? Well, I don't know about that. You know, I'm not sure how the how the state um, is responding to this. But I do think that it's valuable because it, it goes out and says, you know, we surveyed 60 agencies. 60 isn't a huge sample size, but in one state, it is a huge sample size. That is actually a very significant sample size. And, uh, you know, if these respondents are so universally negative on this, I do think that that gives some solid research to back up um, basically what we all know is that (laughs) this is a bad idea. These uh, state agencies using drones have a lot of hurdles to get those drones up in the air. They have to get funding. They have to get approval. They have to get people trained. And to put them back is just not benefiting uh, the taxpayers. Yeah. Yeah. And when the idea is to save lives, Whether it's service member lives or civilian lives, it seems uh, that would make a a really big difference. So, well, in our next piece of news, Miriam, uh, you know, when we talked about BVLOS, you talked very specifically about how some BVLOS waivers were given out and some of the new recommendations are talking about uh, approved, you know, air-based sense and avoid system. But it looks like one new company is coming out with some sort of ground-based sense and avoid or detect system. What does this look like and uh, have we heard of this company before? Yeah, so we have heard of this company before. This is Iris Automation and they make the Cassia model. And this is is very interesting because uh, Iris Automation first introduced the Cassia as kind of a very unique onboard detect and avoid system. It's designed to sort of use computer vision, mirror kind of the capabilities of pilot sight. And it does that in really interesting ways. Got a lot of press as, as new um technology, and they have been able to achieve several BVLOS uh, waivers using that onboard detect and avoid technology. So this is a, an extra piece that goes onto your drone, integrates a- with the avionics. Now, however, they are also introducing the Cassia G, and they've gotten a BVLOS waiver through the Beyond program in their work with the city of Reno to fly beyond visual line of sight using the Cassia G, which is a ground-based detect and avoid system. And what I think is interesting about this is it's sort of showing the evolution of the technology to solve the problem of detect and avoid and flight beyond visual line of sight. And I think what we're finding is that sort of a flexible approach that says for certain types of aircraft, for certain types of operations, ground-based is the best option for certain types of aircraft, other types of operations, onboard detect and avoid is the best option. You know, I think what we've learned, uh, you and I have been in the business a long time, right? Uh, Since observing the evolution of drone regulations from 2013, if we try to learn something from history, it's that you need to take this flexible approach that says this is the problem we need to solve and we'll accept sort of varying technologies as they evolve to meet that goal. And um, so interesting stuff. People continue to um, innovate and detect and avoid. And I think that we are seeing so many tools oriented towards that beyond visual line of sight goal that uh, we should be be there soon. Hopefully we'll see. Yeah. Do you see a system like this being permanently deployed in urban environments as a part of kind of the smart cities plan at all? Is that kind of, would something like this system help out for that? 
I don't know. You know, that's an interesting question. It's possible. And I think it kind of depends on how they um, decide to implement smart cities, you know, for smart cities who decide to implement sort of drone corridors um, or, uh, I don't know, drone bubbles, kind of, you know, like use space areas like they have in Europe. I think it, it kind of depends on how it works. That would certainly be an interesting application. Yeah, very interesting indeed. Very interesting indeed. I have to say this next piece of news, Miriam, is something that has me really, really excited because as an avid FPV pilot myself and as someone who loves F1 racing, to see the next evolution of F1 go from the ground to the sky is quite exciting. And I know this next piece of news is all about one particular drone pilot who has gone from, well, flying FPV to flying in actual drones in literally in the air. I mean, we're talking about, you know, F1 racing in the sky. What's going on here? This, you know, I had to introduce this piece of news um, just because it's so much fun to think about. You know, you you could just sort of imagine this and If you do have a chance, I would recommend people go and check out the article because there are just cool pictures and check out the Airspeeder site. So our feature writer, Jim McGill, did a piece on Lexi Jansen. And Lexi Jansen is a name many people know in the FPV racing world. She's a a drone racer and a social media personality. Um, Very, very smart young lady. And she has now been recruited um, to fly in the airspeeder races. This is happening in Australia, and these are flying car races. And so what they're doing right now is they are training the pilots um, to operate the autonomous flying cars from a screen. Um, They can't use remote controls for because of regulations, the way that the regulations work uh, with the flying cars. So they are operating them on computer screens remotely. And eventually, as regulations allow, they will be in the cockpit of these flying autonomous cars uh, operating the cars and racing. And so such a fascinating thing. The vehicles are unbelievably cool. And I think that, you know, part of the great thing about this is that actually we were just talking about detect and avoid. So if you think of those tiny, tiny little racing drones, um, you know, MIT scientists, I've written so many articles about uh, people using those tiny drones and doing uh, detect and avoid technology so that they can go through cluttered environments, so they can go through trees and things. And so, so the technology that's used in the racing kind of flows over onto the scientific side and it generates a lot of a lot of great innovation. And I think we're going to see the same thing with uh, personal EV tiles and flying cars. So so excited for that. Can't wait to see it. And i um, really excited for Lexi, too. Yeah. And it looks like Lexi moved literally halfway around the world from Poland to Australia. She sure did. Yeah. To pursue her dream, because she said as soon as they said they were going to let me fly it, I was like, I'm there. Wow. <laughs> you know? Wow. Well, I uh, have a feeling she's loading up on sunscreen as we speak. So (laughs) Um, now another piece of news, um, as the West is battling one of the worst droughts in history, I'm sure many of you have heard that year in, year out for decades. Well, there was actually a study that says the United States kind of southwestern region is facing one of the worst droughts in quote unquote 1200 years. I bring this up because in our next piece of news, one technology company is adding a whole new style of sensor to UAVs, measuring, well, the water density in the ground, which we know from NASA imagery is at one of the lowest levels literally in the history of taking these measurements. I'm not sure how it goes back 1,200 years, Miriam, as I looked up the source data for that, and I'm like, wait a minute, this doesn't even go back 1,200 years. So, but that said, what is going on with Black Swift Technologies? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting um, innovation because it just sort of goes to show when you see 
applications that I really haven't seen before. You know, um, we see a lot of different applications, which are variations on a theme, you know, definitely innovative, definitely new, but variations on a theme. And this is a new one. And I think what's really interesting here is that it, it just goes to show you that we're still learning kind of what drones can do, you know, how can they help solve problems? So if you think about the huge, huge variety of scientific sensors that are available, how many of those are appropriate to put in the air? How many of those just need a little tweaking to be able to put them on a drone? We're still just barely scratching the surface. Yeah. So with Black Swift Technologies, I think they're such an interesting company because what they really are is scientists and they just sort of, they, they combine science and drones in such interesting ways. Uh, they've done, you know, volcano research, flying into volcanoes. They've done sort of extreme bivilos, trying to stretch the boundaries of the extreme conditions that you can fly in. And now they're doing um, this soil moisture sensor, you know, they're delivering a full complete drone with the soil moisture sensor to aid in this area of sort of environmental conservation, which is really critical. I mean, it's a critical, critical problem that we're facing right now. So uh, just sort of more very good news from my opinion on how the drone industry is stepping up to, to solve problems in new ways. A hundred percent. It's really, um, it's nice to see it seems like drones are being implemented in more and more and more industries and it's like rapidly growing. And, you know, I was actually talking to Rob about this just last week. We've heard some pilots who say uh, they're struggling to get work. And yet on the flip side of that, we have like more new pilots entering drone U and the flight school than we ever have. And, but it's very unique, nuanced verticals. So it's very interesting to see how, some of the main ways that drones kind of were used um, maybe have hit their saturation, uh, albeit, you know, there are so many other verticals that are literally just trying to get great drone pilots and skilled uh, drone pilots. I mean, we have one client that we just did a training program for a manufacturer, and they are literally asking us to get a bunch of pilots ready to go service these contracts that are already existing. And I mean, it's just really encouraging to see drones being used and adopted in areas and environments that we've just never seen before. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, this is unrequested plug for the drone, you, <laughs> but I really do think that it's all about training. Like it has become sort of all about um, the difference between somebody who's just flying casually and taking pictures and it becomes sort of a much more technical thing where you have to learn how to fly in different conditions. You have to be very precise. You have to be repeatable. You have to, you have to be safe. You have to, and you have to deliver a final data product, you know, not just kind of a folder of pictures. So it, um, you know, the good news and the bad news is that the drone industry is evolving. A hundred percent. It is definitely evolving. Well, Miriam, thank you for keeping us up to date on exactly what is going on in the industry. I know everyone appreciates it and I appreciate it as well. Now that's going to do it for us today. So Miriam, thank you. And thank you to everyone who supports the show. We'll see you next week. <laughs>